After his wild flight on the monster Jerrion in Inferno 17, Dante and Virgil arrive in what we could call Deep Hell. That is, the rings of the Malabolgi. As we heard about in Canto 11, the center of hell and the center of earth is a large circle of ice. And around the circumference of this circle, the floor of hell is sins like the sloping sides of a funnel. And yet into these sloping sides, according to Dante's vivid imagination, are trenches or pits dug down into them. There are little bridges which arch over these little trenches, although some of the infrastructure of hell is still damaged and has been waiting on a work order to be filled for the past 1,000 years. In, the case, in any case, Dante and Virgil, for each one of these ditches, will either climb to the apex of the arching bridge to gain a commanding view which will allow them to look down into the bottoms of those ditches, or they will decide to make their way down into the ditches to explore and hold conversation with the inmates. All of the ditches of Malabolge, or the evil pockets, as Dante calls them, make up the realm of those who use their intellect to be crafty, to devise deceptive strategies which help them fulfill their lustful, avaricious, gluttonous, envious, or wrathful desires. You could think of these sinners as white-collar criminals. But Dante, rather than our contemporary penal system, doesn't put them in minimum security. Rather, he puts them much further down because he sees these sinners as doubly offensive in the eyes of God. Why? Because they were not only consumed by those capital vices which we encountered in the earliest part of hell, not only were they malicious, that is, willing to hurt their fellow human beings if they got in their way, but they also misused that most precious gift of humanity, our speech-making, word-crafting, image-producing intellect because they were calculating in their craft to feed those appetitive desires, they muddied the sacred gift of the human intellect. To quote Dorothy Sayre's delightful essay, The Other Six Deadly Sins, this is the realm of cold sins, in contrast to that first part of hell where, the, where we met the hot sins. And you'll notice that the closer we get to the base of hell, the more icy and frigid the world becomes. At the beginning of Inferno 18, the poet spends quite a bit of time describing the architecture of hell. He compares it to concentric moats around a castle, with clear patterns and a meaningful design. Thus, even here, the design of God can be discovered. The presence of God can be noted by those who have eyes to see, even in hell. But in contrast to the harmonious and ordered arrangement of the stars, what we find here is a kind of overgrown order an order which doesn't inspire admiration, but fear. Its patterns are present, but broken and confusing. When you get to paradise, you'll see that Dante frequently likens the order of heaven and the saintly souls who dwell there to a well-ordered garden. Hell is rather like the order of some, sm some smoking, dirty machine, poorly tended and barely functioning. In Inferno 18, the drama picks up again. The pilgrim and his guide, view the sinners of two different ditches from the safety of the bridges which span them. These sinners are those who are punished as pimps and seducers in ditch one, that is, those who used crafty strategies to trick women into violating the laws of the marital bond. And then in ditch two, we find those who use their words to flatter, that is, those who, use their, who used words of praise almost as if they were selling them. Whatever you want to hear for the right price can be purchased from the flatterer. This is one of the most disgusting crevices of hell. Dante describes it this way. The banks made slimy by a sticky vapor from below were coated with a mold offending eyes and nose. I could see in a ditch below people plunged in excrement that could have come from human privies. Just as human excrement is that which is left over when the body has extracted from food what is useful for nourishment, so too here we find those whose words, like excrement, were deprived of the nutrients which support life. In some ways, these slick speakers are the opposite of the thoughtful poet, who carefully crafts his words both to form nourishing visions of spiritual truths, but also can, when needed, use his words to form a scourge to drive the sinners out. Dante in this canto includes references to contemporary flatterers, those who hung out in medieval political circles and told rulers what they wanted to hear, 
and then dutifully told subjects what the rulers wanted them to hear. But Dante also includes a minor figure from classical literature, Thais, a prostitute, drawing a striking connection between prostitution and flattery. Just as a prostitute, quite apart from love or the desire to better the community, is willing to sell sacred things for money, so too the abuser of words is willing to take something as intimately bound to love as language and sell those sacred things which bind human beings together. We can see how much Dante, the poet, the theoretician of language, thinks of words. For Dante, it's a sacred act to speak, and obfuscating the vision of reality by abusing language is a serious sin in his eyes. Over the next several canti, Dante and Virgil continue to move around the circles in a spiraling descent toward the center of hell. On several occasions, the wayfarers choose to climb down the banks to the bottoms of the ditches for a closer look. In the third ditch, for example, they go down to talk to souls who are being punished for simony. That is, churchmen who abuse their offices by offering privileges and offices to those willing to pay money, as opposed to those who are spiritually worthy. Then Dante sees the twisted fortune tellers, that is, those who longed for the secret knowledge of the future more than tending to what they needed to know for living well in the present. In the fifth ditch, Dante and Virgil descend to meet the baritors, those who sold public offices or governmental goods for bribes. In the sixth polja, we meet the hypocrites, who process like monks, except that they wear heavy cloaks of lead gilded in gold. And finally, before we come to the great canto of Ulysses in Fano 26, we meet the thieves. At this point, before moving into a detailed reading of the canto of Ulysses in Fano 26, which is one of the most important Conti in the entire comedy, I want to focus on four particular scenes in the Conti running up to the Ulysses Canto. The first figure of note is Jason, mentioned briefly in Inferno 18. Jason was the famous Greek hero from mythology who led a band of hardy sailors, the Argonauts, in search of the Golden Fleece, which they stole and brought back home. Generally, these kinds of ancient heroes like Aeneas, Ulysses, Hercules, Theseus, Perseus are positive exemplars for Dante. In fact, Jason's voyage, his epic quest to capture something of great value and bring it home, is alluded to three times in Paradiso and used as a model for Dante's own epic literary undertaking. Dante suggests that he too, like a hero, ventures off to a faraway land and brings back some of its treasure to come back home here on earth. Thus it comes as something of a surprise to find the hero of epic courage here in the ditches of the Malabolge. As Dante and Virgil stand on the bridge which spans the first ditch of the Malabolge, Virgil points him out to Dante. See that imposing figure drawing near. He seems to shed no tears despite his pain. What regal aspect he still bears. He is Jason who by courage and by craft deprive the men of Colchis of the ram. Like other magnanimous figures we have encountered in hell, such as Farinata, Jason is too dignified to whimper like the other souls as he is whipped by the demons. He maintains something of that heroic fortitude and strength, even in the heart of hell. But as the passage goes on to state, the reason he is in hell is because on his return voyage, he used his smooth words, James Bond style, to manipulate a few women, such as Hypsipyle, into aiding him. When he had got the assistance he needed through false promises of love, he abandoned them and continued on his journey. Thus, although Jason's quest was admirable in Dante's eyes, and although the hero's inner strength was adequate, Dante puts Jason in hell because he manipulated people to get what he wanted. Threatening the harmony of human community, even the pursuit of a great and laudable end, is damnable offense in Dante's eyes. In the next canto, Canto 19, Dante meets the so-called Simoniacs, those who sold church offices and dispensed the goods of the church for money. At the very beginning of the canto, he addresses all the Simoniacs with a reference to Simon Magus, that is, the man mentioned in the Bible in Acts 8, who approached Peter to ask if he could purchase the power the apostles exercised in healing in the name of Christ. From the very beginning of this canto, then, we can feel the heat of Dante's passion. 
O Simon Magus, O wretches of his kind, greedy for gold and silver, who prostitute the things of God that should be brides of goodness. The churchmen found within this ditch are all stuffed head first into narrow wells. And when the next Simoniac dies, he too is stuffed into the same hole, smashing the previous sinner further down into the well. But before they get crammed in, they have their legs hanging out of the well, and they kick and writhe because flames burn them on the bottoms of their tender bare feet. In a parody of the sacrament of confession, Dante, the righteous layman, stands beside the wicked churchman, who we learn was Pope Nicholas III. And the poet hears, as it were, his confession. Through his clever artistry, Dante also manages to heap scorn on another pope, Boniface VIII, by asking, by having Nicholas ask, Is that you already? Are you here already, Boniface? By several years the writings lied to me. Are you so swiftly sated with those prophets for which you did not fear to take by guile the beautiful lady and to do her outrage? This is Dante at his strongest. The beautiful lady, of course, is the church. And Dante's condemnation, which he put in the mouth of one of his characters, is that these popes treated the church as a prostitute. Nicholas himself was from a prominent and wealthy Roman family, the Orsini. And one of his acts as pope was to elevate three of his aristocratic family members to become cardinals. He also played hardball politics. He convinced the German emperor to relinquish, relinquish his right to parts of central Italy, which he then appointed his nephews to rule over as counts. Nicholas also began working against Charles of Anjou, the king of Naples, to restrict his land, even though the papacy a decade before had officially handed Sicily over to him. As soon as the pilgrim learns who Nicholas is, he excoriates him for spending his life doing everything but administering the grace of heaven. I do not know if then I was too bold when I answered. Please tell me how much treasure did our Lord insist on from St. Peter before he gave the keys into his keeping. Surely he asked no more than follow me. Stay there then, for you are justly punished, guarding well those gains ill-gotten that made you boldly take your stand against King Charles. And were, I, were it not that I am still restrained by the reverence I owe the keys supreme, which once you held in the happy life above, I would resort to even harsher words, because your avarice afflicts the world, trampling down the good and raising up the wicked. The speech causes the Pope to kick out hard with both his feet, and very much pleases Virgil. It was one of a series of great speeches of denunciation and violent condemnation in these Conti, in which we feel Dante pour forth his hot words out onto evil. It's also interesting to note some of the details of the Contrapasso. Nicholas, who stuffed his purse and life above, is now stuffed indiscriminately into a hole in death. But perhaps more interestingly is how Nicholas's punishment differs from the nourishing nature of the church. Augustine, along with many other Christian theologians, had described the church as always having room for more, as well as being a kind of bosom where the repentant sinner could come and be nourished like an infant nursing from a mother. In hell, we have a kind of parody of the largesse of the church. There's always room for more, but the sinners just get crammed down farther into the same hole, smashed into one another. And rather than finding a place where they are nourished and transformed, they find only stony rock. The Simoniacs enjoy then the unnourishing anti-church they helped create in life. In the next canto, we meet the false prophets whose twisted and broken bodies cause the pilgrim to weep. Reader, so may God let you gather fruit from reading this. Imagine if you can how I could have kept from weeping when I saw up close our human likeness so contorted. Yes, I wept, leaning against a spur of the rough crag. On many other occasions, Dante sighs for sinners, bows in reverence to them, or expresses sorrow at their state. But on this occasion, Virgil rebukes the pilgrim bitterly. We will see that a new attitude towards sinners is being promoted in the deepest section of hell. To the pilgrim's weeping, Virgil replies, Are you still witless as the rest? Here piety lives when pity is quite dead. Who is more impious than one who thinks that God shows passion in his judgment? 
In the next canti, Dante and Virgil go down to explore the ditch where the baritors are punished. Those who abuse their positions in secular governments to dispense public goods, not to those who needed them, but to their friends, are those who offered the appropriate bribes. Now those corrupt officials are forced to stay under boiling pitch, under which, of course, they can't breathe. But when they come up for a quick breath, the devils are there ready to pounce on them and scrape them and poke them and harm their flesh. All of, of all the Conti and the comedy, these are some of the most zany and comic in the lowbrow way. Throughout Conti 21 and 22, the pilgrim is nervously looking around at the band of demons who have been asked by Virgil to escort him through this ditch. But they keep sarcastically joking about him and licking their lips. As you read through the Conti, including the bizarre gesture of the head of the devils farting to signal to his company a forward march, you're supposed to laugh at the kind of slapstick Jim Carrey-like tone of the Conti. But at the same time, I think Dante has created this goofy, levitous tone for a reason. The sinners in this realm, such as Ciampolo, with whom they have a brief conversation, find themselves in a situation a little like the poor they chose not to aid when they had the power to do so in life. Now, like the poor, they live in a condition of desperation in which every time they raise up in order to seek a breath of fresh air, to find a little relief from their suffocating condition, there the demons are waiting for them, those who ought to have aided them rather than torture them. The strange comic tone of these Conti, I think, is appropriate. All of this is funny to us, but it's not funny at all to the souls who are actually suffering from the juvenile, careless, and cruel hatred of the demons. It's almost like being trapped in a nightmare, where everyone around you is careless and laughing, completely indifferent to the desperate anxiety you are suffering. This is a good example of what I have suggested at the beginning of this lecture that Dante hopes to portray those white-collar crimes in a way to make us feel their gravity. We perhaps might not get that exercise over a little graft. What's wrong with rewarding some of the folk back home with valuable but useless building projects? Everyone does it, right? But Dante forces us to view these offenses for what they are, threatening to the harmony of a community. In Canto 23, we meet the hypocrites and now they are completely weighed down by their own religious cloaks. Lead on the outside in sparkling gold, lead on the inside in sparkling gold on the outside. They're so weighed down they can barely move, and so they inch along and wearied step after step. For Dante and for the monastic tradition, hypocrisy is the sin of those who love their reputation for holiness more than they love holy things themselves. Of course, you can lead a good life and seek wisdom, and it's likely that if you do so, you'll gain a reputation. In some ways, this form of honor is the natural fruit of virtue. But there's always the danger that you start pursuing what is truly good and saying things or doing things primarily in order to support or promote your reputation. It's a subtle distinction, and it's a difficult thing to perceive in our own motives. But imagine if you did get yourself into the habit of using your words more and more to say things, not so much because you thought they were true, but to enhance your reputation. It would be then very much as Dante describes, a weaving for yourself a weighty cloak in which you would eventually be crushed by your own words and false appearances, as well as the fear of being found out for what you really are. One ancient monastic writer by the name of Evagrius summed it up this way. Monks seek, quote, a life lived free of all hypocrisy, for vainglory has a frightful power to cover over and cast virtues into the shade. Ever searching out praise from men, it banishes faith. The good must be pursued for its own sake, not for some other cause. Following after the contour of the hypocrites comes a section of poetry which Dante thought was as impressive a tour de force as what he had penned in describing the flight of Jarian. In fact, the Florentine poet boasts that he has surpassed those poets the pilgrim had met in the castle of Limbo in Canto IV. Let Lucan now fall silent. Let Ovid not speak. Ovid, of course, had been the great poet of Metamorphoses. He who described how human beings were changed into other forms, say like Daphne being changed into a tree or a young girl being transformed into her own echo. But Dante's 
But Dante's description, he is proud to say, surpasses these in intensity. He tells of how the souls of the thieves are transformed into all those sorts of nasty reptiles. Some of his thieves, thieves are attacked by flying snakes who pierce the sinners' necks. The sinners then catch fire and burn down to ashes before they're remade again, their ashes being slowly gathered up together and reformed into the shape of human beings. Dante also meets a famous badass, a kind of medieval equivalent of the leader of a biker gang, Vani Fucci, who boasts that, I love the life of beasts and not of men, just like the mule I was. I am Vani Fucci, animal. Pistoia was my fitting den. But rather to his embarrassment, Vani Fucci is this far down in hell, he should be up among the violent, because he stole vessels from a sacristy. To express his rage then, Vani Fucci uses a medieval gesture of the fig, which is equivalent to flipping someone off. But he directs his obscene gesture at God. Dante describes the scene at the beginning of Inferno 25. Then, making the figs with both his thumbs, the thief raised up his fist and cried, Take that, God, is aimed at you. From that time on, the serpents were my friends, for one of them coiled itself around his neck as if to say, now you shall speak no more, while another enmeshed his arms and held him fast, knotting itself so tight around his front he could not even twitch his arms. Through all the gloomy rounds of hell, I saw no soul so prideful against God, not even him who toppled from the walls at Thebes, that is, Capanius. We have yet again a sinner who, though he suffers externally, his real punishment is the hatred that he generates from the inside the hatred in which his heart is always steeped. Vanifucci serves as a powerful image of the sinner, eternally flipping God off, cursing at God, spitting in his face. His own angry soul, though, makes him blind and deaf to the harmony and love which exist within God. But it's also in this canto where Dante goes all in with his poetry. And again, we have to imagine this poetic accomplishment in an age before video games and movies a kind of six-legged Gila monster like Lizard, climbs up on one of the thieves. It digs his dirty claws into the man's stomach, digs his upper claws into his arms, and then wraps his other legs between the thief's legs and fastens onto the lower back, before turning his head and biting the man's cheeks between his teeth. Then they start to melt into one another, so that the man becomes a lizard, and the lizard pours itself into the man. It's a passage which is powerful on the poetic level, but that power is used to express the depth of the moral world, to chase out, chase out from every hiding place the secret things of the heart. That is, to externalize them and then turn them inside out. And that is particularly appropriate here, because the thieves in life sought secrecy, tried to conceal their craft and stratagems for stealing. And much like serpents, they lay in wait to ambush. And also like serpents, they were unproductive beasts, loathsome creatures who didn't do any honest work, right? They're not dogs or cows or horses. They didn't produce good things. And so Dante takes these inner abstract truths and lets them find an incarnation in his poetry. To do so, Dante racked his brain for all the passages from classical literature which described nasty snakes or lizards or flying serpents and poured them all into his hell, an accomplishment he was quite proud of. So here we are, having crossed over and climbed down into ditches where we have seen faces covered in human excrement. Bodies, diseased and twisted into severe deformities. Bodies almost crushed under the weight of metal cloaks. And finally, souls which are bitten, clawed, and penetrated by loathsome reptiles. These conti of Dante are quite intense. And so it is with a bit of start that we leave the serpents behind and come up to a bluff, which overlooks a peaceful valley, where the souls shine like lightning bugs glowing in their own light, seemingly with a beauty which attracts the pilgrim in Inferno 26. Dante uses a peaceful pastoral simile, which helps completely change the tone of his poetry, from the kind of heavy metal of the Conti of the Thieves to the string quartet of Inferno 26. He turns down the intensity. As when a peasant resting on a hillside, in the season when he who lights the world least hides his face from us, 
at the hour when the fly gives way to the mosquito, sees fireflies that glimmer in the valley, with just so many flames the eighth crevice was everywhere aglow. Dante immediately follows this pastoral simile up with a second one, in which he compares these glowing flames now to Elijah's fiery chariot. The point Dante is making is that the pilgrim's eyes attracted to these beautiful flickering lights. He's taken in with their beauty. And as we, as we shall see later, the souls here are in fact wrapped in a fiery light which makes them resemble, on the outside at least, the appearance of souls in paradise. This explains Dante's reaction. Rising to my feet to look, I stood up on the bridge. Had I not grasped a jutting crag, I would have fallen in without a shove. Virgil notices the pilgrim's enthusiasm in verse 46 and tells the pilgrim that within the most Within the most beautiful flame stand two souls who used deceptive strategies at the Battle of Troy. That is, Diomedes, who never speaks, and Ulysses. To this the pilgrim responds with more excitement than at any other time in the comedy. I pray you, Master, and I pray again, and may my prayer be a thousand strong. Do not forbid my lingering a while until the twin fort flame arrives. You see how eagerly I lean in its direction? As we have said, within this flame is the suffering soul of Ulysses. This is the Ulysses who, of course, is the Odysseus of Homer, the hero from Ithaca, who was persuaded to travel to Troy to help the Greeks win back Helen by destroying the city of Troy. In Homer's account, Odysseus is, above all, known for his wits, his ability to persuade, and his ability to strategize. After the war, Odysseus begins his long trek home, a journey which becomes even longer because his curiosity constantly gets the best of him. For example, he enters the cave of a one-eyed monster, a cyclops, because he wants to receive a memorable guest gift from him, and he barely gets himself and a few remaining crew members out of the cave alive. Later, Odysseus stages his ship so that he can hear, be the only man to hear the song of the sirens without being lured to his death. Odysseus then is a kind of swaggering, confident, but lovable hero who cleverly twists the truth when he needs to. But the commentary tradition after Homer rather transformed Odysseus, surprisingly, into a philosophical hero. For the philosophical tradition, believe it or not, Odysseus became the exemplar of the man who was so discontent with the ways of the world that he sought out the depths of wisdom. For this philosophical tradition, Odysseus's search for his homeland of Ithaca represents the gradual awakening of the inner power of the soul to know God. As one ancient philosopher, Plotinus, asked, What then is our way of escape, and how are we to find it? We shall put out to sea as Odysseus did from the witch Circe or Calypso, as the poet says, I think, with a hidden meaning and was not content to stay, though he had delights of the eyes and lived among much beauty of sense. Our country from which we came is there, our father is there. How shall we travel to where? How shall we travel to it? Where is our way of escape? We cannot get there on foot, for feet only carry us everywhere in this world, from one country to another. You must not get ready a carriage either, or a boat. Let all these things go and do not look. Shut your eyes and change to and wake another way of seeing, which everyone has but few use. Although Dante did not read Greek, we know that he read many Latin authors who passed along this kind of teaching about Ulysses. One of the authors he loved the most was Boethius, who describes Ulysses as a figure of wisdom, the philosophical hero who refuses to be enchanted by the goods of the world and always maintains a kind of healthy restlessness in his heart for his real home. For other commentators, Ulysses' philosophical power is on display in the story of his encounter with the Cyclops. For one medieval author, the one-eyed Cyclops stands in contrast to the wise man who, in possession of both his eyes, is able to view temporal goods and heavenly goods at once. The Cyclops, he continues, stands for pride, which blinds men to everything but measuring their happiness by means of worldly goods. In contrast to the Cyclops of such limited vision, Ulysses' name, he tells us, means omnium sensus, an understanding of everything. 
Ulysses is said to be wise, since he has experience of all things. This is in part the kind of Ulysses the pilgrim meets here in the comedy. But Dante also drew on one more tradition about the ancient hero Ulysses, that is, that this great and curious traveler didn't end his life in Ithaca, but rather continued to journey to come to know more and more of the world. But where he died, no one knew. Thus Dante takes this opportunity to have his own character, Ulysses, reveal the secret of his death, a kind of moment of fan lit. Ulysses says that he convinced his old shipmates to go on one last adventure with him in search of the unknown. Here are Ulysses' own famous words. I and my shipmates had grown old and slow by the time we reached the narrow strait where Hercules marked off the limits, warning all men to go no farther. On the right side I left Seville behind, and on the other I had left Ceuta. In other words, they sail out of the Mediterranean and through the Straits of Gibraltar. O oh, brothers, I said, who in the course of a hundred thousand perils at last have reached the West, to such brief wakefulness of our senses as remain to us, do not deny yourselves the chance to know, following the sun, the world where no one lives. Consider how your souls were sown. You were not made to live like brutes or beasts, but to pursue virtue and knowledge. With this brief speech, I had my companions so ardent for the journey, I could scarce have held them back. This is one of those passages of literature which sends shivers down your spine. It's so good and inspiring. But Ulysses continues his narrative, explaining that when he and his men had sailed down into the southern hemisphere, they saw a mountain rising up out of the mist. A mountain he did not know, and it excited them because it seemed like that mysterious land for which they had set out for. Dante will later help us understand that this is the mountain of purgatory. They almost made it. Ulysses' speech and story are so moving that we feel ourselves responding to this narrative as if it were a brief play, the tragedy of noble Ulysses. In fact, the passage is so powerful that many scholars of Dante over the years have pondered why Dante even put Ulysses in hell in the first place. After all, he seems so brave and indomitable, even in old age. He reminds his companions that you were not made to live like brutes or beasts, but to pursue virtue and knowledge. But even more importantly, Ulysses seeks not just experience of the world, but wishes to know that which is beyond it, that more remote beyond. Pu oltre. Ulysses has a keen sense that there is something more of the depths, something which all things have reference to. And Ulysses' ardor, his fervor to know, is so great that he's willing to run the risk over again of all those dangers he had already been through. Ulysses has a sense of urgency and a strong sense of the brevity of life, what he calls this too brief vigil of our senses. His boldness is all the more evident when we keep in mind contemporary cartographical knowledge of the day. To pass through these gates, the Straits of Gibraltar, was a dramatic abandonment of the known world, the world with boundaries and security. He was, as it were, passing over on the dark side of the page. Ulysses is like one of those people who puts us to shame, so great, so tireless, so noble in his heart. But as his tale comes to an end, the crescendo of hope is dramatic before it's destroyed by the final storm. On the horizon, the crew sees a mountain, which takes their breath away. The man who spent his whole life encountering giants, monsters, witches, storms, and mysterious powers is stunned by this prodigy, the dark mountain which rises on the horizon. He and his crew rejoice seemingly convinced that here they have found what they have been looking for, that which was beyond human, pu ultra. It is at this moment, of course, that their hopes and ship are destroyed. By whom? He does not know. After five months of sailing, he says, they saw a mountain, distant, dark, and dim. In my sight it seemed higher than any I had seen. We rejoiced, but joy soon turned to grief. For from that an unknown land there came a whirlwind that struck the ship head on. Three times it turned her and all the waters with her, 
At the fourth our stern reared up, the prow went down as pleased another, until the sea closed over us. And for what reason? Why such a noble desire would marry at such an end seems beyond his kin. In search of the, bl of the sublime, Dante's Ulysses is overcome by the tragic. You'll remember the two similes used at the beginning of the canto. Ulysses, although desiring to ascend to heaven like Elijah in a chariot, actually is more akin to a firefly which glows in the summer evening. So what did he do wrong? And perhaps more importantly, why does Dante work so hard to get us to admire yet again yet another sinner in hell? You've heard me say it before, but a full answer to this question will only become clear later. In fact, Dante dramatically closes this canto after Ulysses speaks. He gives us no answer. He does not tell us why he has made us appreciate so much a sinner in the depths of hell. But in some ways, the answer only gets more problematic. Because in Paradise, Dante will compare his own poetic journey to God, to Ulysses' journey out into the unknown. He takes Ulysses' tragic failure as the model for his own poetic journey. But for now, note how at the beginning of this, his speech, Ulysses seems to reveal a bad conscience. When I took leave of Circe, who for a year and more beguiled me there, not far from Gaeta before Aeneas gave it that name, not tenderness for a son, nor filial duty toward my aged father, nor the love I owed Penelope that would have made her glad could overcome the fervor that was mine. Hmm. Ulysses accidentally, as it were, contextualizes his own epic journey when he recalls that very different journey of Aeneas. And this brings out a huge difference. Ulysses' journey began with a choice to disembark from the larger human community, a decision which runs, as we hear Ulysses himself say, directly contrary to Aeneas' willful choice to remain allied and united to those human relationships which touched him, his fatherhood, his sonship, his kinship to Trojans, his status as ancestor to future generations of Romans. It's telling that Ulysses, although he first says his passion is to know the ways and customs of men, urges his crew to seek, quote, that experience of the world without people, end quote. Ulysses lacks the willingness to found, defend, and cultivate the city. He lacks allegiance to a particularized human community, and he lacks the willingness to remain bound by those human relationships. One scholar puts it this way, the Greek hero is guilty of transgressing the laws of nature and society. As a man, he should not have ventured into the uninhabitable world. As an old man, he should have returned to the haven of Ithaca and prepared himself for death. As a king, it was his duty to acquire the supreme virtues of justice and prudence. But recall what Virgil had said before the conversation with, with Ulysses even began. You remember that Virgil identified the flame wherein Ulysses dwells as the flame wherein, quote, they mourn the stratagem of the horse that made a gateway, through which the noble seat of Rome, Aeneas, came forth. Long before he launched out on this journey, Ulysses was the one who developed the crafty trick of the horse to destroy an ancient city. In light of this, Ulysses' end was in some ways the fitting conclusion to his life of fraudulence. He was the end which he had inadvertently practiced for. To frame this very precisely in the thought of Thomas Aquinas, Ulysses was guilty of astutia, that is, the use of false or counterfeit means, even when pursuing a good end, which is a perversion of prudentia, or prudence. To state it plainly, just as Ulysses, in using the deception of the Trojan horse to win a war, tried to skip a step in that battle, as it were, by using trickery, so too did that bad formation, that bad practice, that tendency to skip steps, also play out at the end of his life. Ulysses pursues the highest end with bravery and heroism, but he tried to skip the intermediary steps of virtue which he could only have learned within human communities. I think it's for this reason that we can both admire Ulysses 
and even imitate his boldness and desire to know that which is pu ultra, that which is beyond, while at the same time being warned by Dante, as he says in verses 21 to 22, that we must curb our powers lest they run on where virtue fails to guide them.